I have always loved watching the rain. I've always loved watching storms. I remember as a child, um, I lived in, in Africa, and at night I would get up when it was just blowing and storming, and I would crack the windows open, and I would just feel the wind and feel the rain, and, and then lightning would, would strike and light up the sky, and you could see the, the coconut trees like literally swaying almost to the ground and somehow not breaking. Yeah, I think we've all been there. We can all relate to that yeah. experience, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> the, there's nothing quite like the monsoon rains. Um, however, there are other experiences that maybe are a little closer to home. Um, here, I remember one year, a few years back, our little tree in the front of the of our yard, it fell over the whole root system. Evidently, it hadn't gone down deep. It was, it was all horizontal. And so the whole little tree came up and its root system was up. You know, I've had uh, so many different experiences of these heavy storms and the heavy wind, and those are powerful experiences. But there's also another experience that I'm reminded of today. It's this phenomenon where, where and maybe you've experienced where you walk out and the sun is shining and it's also raining. And evidently there's a name for it, sun shower, like that's a thing. I didn't know that. Um, and sometimes, like scientifically, sometimes it's like a, a prevalent wind that brings the droplets in from a ways away. At other times, uh, it's explained because the, the clouds that hold the moisture dissipate so quickly that you can't quite see them. Um, but it's so interesting. There's this juxtaposition as I'm standing there experiencing the sun and also experiencing the rain together in the same space, in the same time frame. You know, in life, we, we hold a lot of things simultaneously. We hold joy and sorrow at the same time. We hold success and failure. We hold strength and weakness. We hold wholeness and brokenness, often at the same time. And I'm struck today by the profound beauty that these things are not mutually exclusive. So today, we're going to talk about good news, and we're going to talk about persecution. We're in a series in the book of Acts, a book that tells the story of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, uh, and the passing on of the torch as the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, and the uh, apostles are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of Jesus, a risen Savior and Messiah. The book of Acts tells the story of the persecution that begins, of the bold preaching and teaching, the, the sharing of good news by these apostles, the powerful acts and the healings that we'll see today, and also of all of the struggle that ensues. And so today we continue our story uh, in Acts chapter 5 as we see healings and as we see the religious leaders in Israel uh, lashing out against this new movement, the church that has begun to form. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds also, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. You can see that at the beginning of this movement, uh, the hope that is surrounding it, right? The hope of healing, the hope of new life, the hope of something more than what these people had been experiencing in this moment. We see the continued story of Peter, one of Jesus' apostles, beginning to do the things that Jesus had been doing while he was on earth, healing many people. You see the reverence of the people as they looked at Peter, if only his shadow might fall upon me, maybe I too could be healed. You see 
see incredible movement beginning to take place in Jerusalem and the surrounding area area of Israel. Uh, I think of Jesus' words here as he said to Peter, uh, whose name means rock. Uh, he says, you are the rock upon which I will build this church. And now we see that beginning to develop as Peter is in the central position of healing, the central position of people recognizing and witnessing something new is developing in this world around us. And we see here how they met, the believers met, in Solomon's colonnade. And that's that's an interesting um, little part of this story. Solomon's colonnade was actually outside of the temple. It could be considered um, almost like a, a covered walkway or a porch, but it was a rather large gathering area. But it was more a public. Um, it, was, it, was, it was more an inclusive space because the temple had different courts that different people were allowed to be in. And whereas in the in Solomon's colonnade, um, women and Gentiles and, and anyone could be there. And so it was a place of uh, where people gathered, and it was a common place for religious discussion, a common place to, to look at scripture together and talk about scripture. And so the believers met there right outside of the temple. We see in Luke's description um, both the hope and um, and the healing and the opportunity, but we also see uh, he, he identifies this strange uh, phenomenon also, the fear that is around this movement as well. And I think it comes from a number of places. If we had been, if you had been sitting at home and just reading through the book of Acts, you would have remembered that the previous story was about Ananias and Sapphira, whose hearts were hardened and their greed and jealousy uh, resulted in uh, their death. And people are afraid and like, what's happening in this moment? So we certainly have the continuation of that story. Uh, the, people are flocking towards the apostles and yet also fearful of stepping in on that gathering. Uh, um, but the other uh, cause for fear is that uh, immediately as the apostles had begun healing people here at the temple, they had been arrested. And today again, in response to uh, this moment in this story, uh, they're going to be arrested by the Sanhedrin. So there is excitement and joy in juxtaposition. Uh, on the other hand, there is uh, fear and confusion as to exactly what is developing in this moment. You know, whenever I read scripture, I always have questions. I'm like, I want more details. I want to know more about this aspect or more about this aspect. And um, it's interesting to look carefully at this story and note what the author Luke does include. And one of the details that Luke gives is that as as many more people were added to their number, many more people were were believing in Jesus, both men and women were putting their faith in Jesus. And this is really significant for a first century Jewish author to include this in this. I'm reminded in Acts 2 when we were talking about Pentecost, the prophecy from Joel, that in the last days God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people, both men and women, young and old. And in a culture and time in which women were typically ignored and certainly ignored in um, written narrative, ignored in the written history, Luke emphasizes that this was a movement that was expanding, that both men and women were coming to believe in Jesus. And this is the very beginning of that expansion. We're at the very beginning of the book of Acts. We're going to, it's still predominantly a Jewish movement, um, but we, we begin to see the norms of the culture being expanded, the boundaries of this movement being reformed by the Holy Spirit. And that is really exciting to see it begin. Mm -hmm. The story continues, and we're going to read for just a minute in Acts chapter 5, so pull it up or follow along on the screen. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, uh, then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, 
and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then some came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went uh, with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thetis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it came, it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He, too, was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men, and you will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. It's such a beautiful story. It's so telling of the era and what's developing in this moment. God is on the move. The church is growing and excitement and people are thriving in this moment. And as always happens when God's on the move, uh, evil comes to confront. Have you ever noticed that in your own life? It's those moments of greatest victory that are often followed by the the greatest sorrow or the greatest struggle in our lives. And we see it developing in the story of the church, in the beginning of this incredible movement that is spreading in in Jerusalem. Uh, We see the Sadducees. It says in the beginning, Luke identifies what the Sadducees, what the religious rulers of the era are, are feeling, and it's jealousy. They're jealous as the people flock away from them and towards this story of a risen Messiah, towards this story of Jesus who has risen from the dead. And we see this cycle beginning to repeat. Again, if we'd been reading from the beginning of Luke, we'd have seen this play out other times in the past. After healing of a man who uh, could not walk since birth, uh, they're arrested and they're brought on trial. But you'll see the religious leaders noticing the, the people are flocking towards this. They're fearful of the people and the response if they are to squelch it uh, with violence or, or, or in too authoritarian a way. And so we find the Sadducees, the religious rulers, jealous that the people are moving away from them and towards this hope in Jesus, uh, and also fearful, trying to figure out how then will we shut down this movement before it gets too far. And so they use their power. Mm -hmm. They have the power to arrest these men and throw them in jail, and that's exactly what they do. And we don't know um, what Peter was doing in jail, but I imagine he was praying 
And I imagine, as I, as I see this, this story unfold in my mind's eye, that he was still a little surprised when the angel came to the door <laughs> and unlocked the jail cell. I imagine there, there was, you know, some people thinking of this as an escape, but in reality, it wasn't a miraculous escape. It was a miraculous release that the angel came and let them out. And not only let them out, but then spoke to them. Yeah, the angel comes, not giving them the opportunity to run and be safe from the rulers, but instead says, I want you to go at first light and stand in the middle of the temple in front of the very people that just arrested you and tell them about Jesus. Go ahead. Like, that's a little scary. Yeah, like I mean... Talk about stoking the flame, talking about inciting the rage of the people. The angel says, I'm going to let you out, but it's not for your safety. Uh, here's what you're going to do. And so they do. Uh, they walk into um, the temple courts, and they begin to tell about, I think this phrase was so interesting in there, um, tell about this new life. Tell people all about this new life. And it just got me thinking, so what is this new life that the angel is inviting them to, to speak about? Throughout the first few uh, chapters of the book of Acts, Luke has been describing us, describing for us um, what this new life looks like. Well, first of all, we just noticed it entails prison time, uh, so that doesn't sound ideal, and yet you'll find the apostles rejoicing even in that, right? Uh, but it, it's a people, it's a movement marked by joy and enthusiasm in community. Uh, it's a people um, uh, who are intentionally diving deeper into both the Old Testament scriptures they'd been given and leaning into what the Holy Spirit was revealing as new in this season. It's a people with a common purpose who were sharing their resources for the betterment of all of them. Uh, it's a people marked by hope uh, far beyond the current circumstances, the jail time or the persecution or anything that couldn't scratch the surface of the joy and the hope that they were experiencing in this moment. You know, as you describe the new life that we see in the book of Acts, I want to pause just for a second and ask some questions that we might reflect on our lives and, and what this new life might mean. What, what does new life look like for us in your life? What does new life in Jesus look like? How are our lives different because we're following Jesus than they would be if we weren't. Is there much of a difference? And if so, what is the difference? How does knowing Jesus change how we engage day to day? How does knowing Jesus change how we view ourselves and how we view others? Where is the newness of life in our lives. And friends, none of those questions are meant to provoke guilt in us, but rather to, to get us to stop for a minute and think about this new life and realize that there is an invitation to newness of life that is beyond our imagination and that God is inviting each and every one of us to a new life right now. You're going to leave us with questions, oh, not yeah. no, I'm give not us answering any it. answers. Yeah. Yes. You're yes. going to throw this quiz out here and not give us a cheat sheet. There, no, that's not the point. There is a cheat sheet. The point sheet, is the Bible. that we get to reflect on our lives. Like, where am I experiencing this new life? Where is God inviting me to lean in? And, I mean, we can give some general answers, but we each, that's our work to do, right? In community. I actually like it in that position. When Sarah and I were um, talking about this text this week and, and doing our planning, I remember in this moment um, just identifying that these apostles found themselves in a place so joyful, so hopeful about what God is doing in this moment, that, that their joy and their hope would, would supersede even the suffering they're experiencing in this season. And, and I had to identify uh, that's a beautiful thing that they learned to do, and I'm still learning to do. 
Like often in my life, I'm not able to tap in to that experience and that kind of hope and joy, even in moments of suffering. And so what I like about it being questions instead of answers is it identifies we're all on a journey. You know, we're all being refined. We're all being invited deeper into this story. Uh, We are all in a season of getting to know more of this hope and joy as we continue to lean in to what the Spirit's doing. And so we have here the Sanhedrin and the high priest um, uh, questioning the apostles uh, and, uh, and, and identifying, you know, you're, you're breaking our laws, you can't do this any longer. And they make this really curious statement, um, you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now, it's such a strange statement to me uh, because their guilt is already determined. Like, whether or not they're guilty, these guys have no say in, right? The, the Sanhedrin's not on trial right now, uh, maybe in the eyes of the people, which is certainly what they're referring to. They're jealous, and they're beginning to get defensive because these apostles are making great claims about Jesus that reflect poorly upon the Sanhedrin. Uh, they are already guilty. Uh, what's happening is the apostles are beginning to pull back the rug. Everything they tried to sweep under the rug is beginning to be exposed as the miracul- as the miracles are performed, as the good news is shared with people. All of a sudden, they're starting to realize we look really bad in this moment. And there's a power dynamic at play for sure here because they're the they're the religious rulers they're the ones who according to them in that society should have the power and they gave these strict orders to stop preaching about Jesus and these men did not obey and uh, and so the apostles respond to that power play they respond to that very clearly and they said judge for yourself should we obey you or should we obey God you know, we, we need to follow God. And though you killed Jesus, you had the power to do that. God raised him from the dead. And God has seated him um, at his right hand as prince and savior. And so the disciples respond basically by saying, you know, you don't have the power that you think you have. Like in this God has the power, um, and there is hope found in Jesus. There is repentance and forgiveness of sin found in the risen Savior. And so on trial, uh, this brilliant man named Gamaliel uh, steps up to speak. And I-, I want you to say his name ten times. Gamaliel? Gamaliel? Is that, is that good? Yeah, is that okay? No, okay. it's just we, really hard. Okay. I always have to stop and think yeah. that. Sorry. This I pause is totally there as well. Uh, that, did I just totally throw you off your point? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this man Gamaliel stands up in front of uh, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, and everyone with a brilliant word. I love a pragmatic approach. A man who's sitting and assessing the situation and thinking through the implications of it. Um, I, we find out later in the book of Acts that Gamaliel is uh, one of the rabbis, one of the teachers that instructed Saul, who will become Paul, and the latter half of the book of Acts is the story of Paul and his missionary journeys and, and all that he's doing and his deep understanding of the Old Testament scriptures and what God had been doing through the Israelites. Um, and, and it's neat to know that that's the man that had been teaching Paul. And so here he finds himself, I would imagine, a little bit unsure. I mean, he's sitting in the council that is kind of opposed to this church thing. Although different people in there are going to have different opinions, I'd imagine he's at least, at best, he's on the fence, maybe kind of wondering if this could be true, but still in the position of holding to what has always been, clinging to what they've known, clinging to the power and the tradition that they have experienced all through this time. And yet he's able in this moment to uh, to slow down enough to say, hold on, what happens if we react in this moment? He says, it's time that we slow down and see what happens. Keep in mind, many other people have come claiming to be the Messiah. Hundreds of people flocked to them, and each time they were killed, the people dispersed, and it ended quickly. And he says, now, this isn't looking exactly like those times. I think he's identifying the, the numbers of people and the way this movement is gaining momentum and, and the excitement of the nation uh, certainly is a sign that this could be something different. And he says, if we were to react in this moment against it, we would only find ourselves working working against God if this is truly from him. I think it's a beautiful position to take, right? Because 
of all their knowledge of, of Scripture, of all their knowledge and, and life experience, they could draw a conclusion, and the majority of them in this moment would say, put these men to death and let's squelch this movement. And yet this truly was a movement of God. And, and I think about us in our lives today, the ability to either react upon our own assumptions and understandings or the ability to slow down and say, God, where are you at work in this moment? God, what are you doing? It assumes that we don't always have the right understanding, the right information. We're not always drawing the right conclusions, but that God is at work. And it puts us in a position of learning to trust and learning to listen and learning to wait. And I think that's a beautiful example and opportunity in our lives. The Sanhedrin listened to this, um, to this man's, Gamaliel's, um, argument, and it says they, he convinced them, and yet also, so they didn't kill the apostles, and yet also they still had them flogged. So there's still both bodily harm and also a public disgrace, a public reprimand. Um, it was a cruel punishment still, and they send him off with a warning to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Having been flogged, they walk out. It says they left rejoicing. I love that. You're like, what? What is happening in these men's life? That after having been beaten publicly, they walk out rejoicing because they'd been considered worthy of suffering humiliation for the name of Jesus. That makes me think of the sunshine and the rain. Again, And I think the good news of Jesus, the good news that God is saving humanity through Jesus, exists in the midst of human suffering, in the midst of pain, both at large in our societies globally and also in our personal lives. And pain and suffering can come from a lot of different places. It can come from the brokenness of, of this world, just living in a fallen world with natural disasters and, and sickness. It can come from sin and evil. It could come from persecution because of someone's faith, like we see in this story. But regardless of the circumstances, Jesus is good news. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the anguish that we may be in, the pain and the suffering, Jesus is still good news. And as I reflected on that this week, that has brought such hope and such freedom because it's so easy to be blinded by our pain. It's so easy to, to, Look out and only see that which is right here. You know, I've traveled a lot and, um, uh, had opportunity to be in airplanes. And sometimes as you're, as you're taking off, it's raining and it's stormy and the clouds are like block the window, you know, as you're looking out the little window and it's turbulent and it's rough and it always makes me anxious. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> and then, the plane gets above the cloud cover and it's calm and you see the sunshine and it's actually gorgeous up there above the, the storm. And here's what keeps coming to mind, that the presence of storms does not in any way diminish the existence of the sun. And that that is like naturally true <laughs> and also metaphorically true in our lives that Jesus is good news. So if you are in a season of, of rain right now in which there is a whole lot of pain or suffering, I just want to offer that as a word of encouragement that even in the midst of that, there is so much good news. Let's pray about that. God, we thank you for this day, for a time to... I open scripture to read a, a story that is both entertaining and uh, is incredibly enlightening. Uh, God, we pray for your light in our lives, uh, that whether we find ourselves in a season of storm or one of joy and hope, that we might be rooted in the knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, 
and that there is hope that sin and death have been conquered. And as we find ourselves still at times soaking wet and struggling, uh, God, that we might um, be reminded of the good news that that Jesus reigns sovereign, uh, that you alone are God, and, and that you dwell in and amongst us in your spirit. Uh, God, may we know in the week to come that kind of hope, that kind of joy. In Jesus' name, amen.